Well, first of all, thanks for coming to this panel. Um, I was realizing before, I think, uh, this might be the first like in-person presenting experience, so hopefully we'll not have any nerves, but uh, definitely with a smaller group, we have plenty of stuff to present, but hopefully it also can be you know, moments to pause for conversation and questions as we go. Um, so I will quickly kick us off. Um, so first of all, actually the topic, just to make sure y'all are in the right place, obviously, um, we're here to talk about continuous optimization and consensus building and approach to web and platform work. Um, and so we'll do a quick intro of ourselves. Um, I'll start off, I'm Katie Jamison. I am a senior VP at Blue State um, and uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Taylor for a quick intro and we'll talk about where we work. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Taylor Darnell. I'm a senior website and marketing manager at MSF USA. Um, I'm probably not the only one whose haircut has changed dramatically over the last two years, but we are here to talk about a different sort of change management. And I did plan that joke uh, two days ago. Um, so what is uh, MSF? Uh, well, it's an international uh, organization that provides uh, critical medical humanitarian aid around the world, wherever it's needed most, uh, whether it is epidemics, pandemics, uh, conflict zones, natural disasters, um, what we're trying to do as an organization, obviously, is save lives and are often you know, the first people into uh, really dire situations uh, to provide that care. Um, we want to stress always that it's independent, impartial, uh, something that is independently funded, um, doesn't operate based on um, the mandates or approvals of governments and governing bodies. Um, yeah, and has been around for 50 years, if I hadn't mentioned, since 1971. Um, and I'll get into a little bit later kind of the specifics of what we're talking about when it comes to the web property, doctorswithoutborders.org. Uh, there is kind of a different relationship or it's not as direct as, you know, we worked on the site for all of MSF, but I'll get into that in a second. And I work for Blue State. Um, so we have a colleague of ours over here, Sam, who presented in the same room a few days ago. Uh, Blue State is a... Um, Digital agency, we do work primarily in the nonprofit uh, and advocacy sectors. We actually have, and we'll talk about this in a second, we've worked with MSF for many, many years, and Blue State is an, uh, a firm that basically does work across the spectrum, including web platform design, but then also runs you know, full service campaigns, spanning email, social, um, for a number of nonprofits for fundraising, advocacy, and um, brand engagement. So we have a pretty strong and robust uh, digital platform practice, which is actually led up by my colleague Sam over here in the front. Uh, but we also have a unique POV where we're not just looking at that channel alone, we're really looking at the full, full suite of things, which I think is a good segue to some of the ways that we've approached thinking about work in partnership with MSF. Um, so I'll kick us off. So just in terms of you know, the topic at hand, you know, part of what we're really wanting to talk about in this is, you know, a lot of the panels that I know have been central to the um, programming of DrupalCon are focusing around tools, technology, all the specifics of how we're approaching major rebuilds, projects of that nature. And, you know, a bit of what we're wanting to talk about today is actually beyond just the, the specifics of tools and solutions to all of the fun, change management, process management, that really is, I think, the hardest part of, of our jobs, oftentimes, in navigating large-scale projects and redesigns. And so I wanna talk a little bit about kind of what I see as the state of the you know, .org redesign, is what we're saying, and again, we kind of have a little bit of a focus in leaning into nonprofit sector, of course, um, given, given the specific use case of, of MSF. So what I like to talk about is, all right, we're all in this you know, ideal mindset before we embark upon a major redesign or project for our organizations, and we kind of begin with that ideal. So it's the ideal, it's a user-first mindset. We're gonna approach it with the best-in-class design and tech solutions. Uh, we're gonna have empowered lean teams, agile data-driven approach, um, run by those with real expertise, well-budgeted, and of course, you know, optimized over time. And the reality, I think for most of us who've been a part of website redesigns, of which I have spent about the past 15 years uh, playing many roles in from project management to the kind of um, senior relationship management with our clients is obviously a very, very different story, which is um, lots of contradictory opinions, little process or empowerment for brokering consensus, stakeholders rarely looped in um, as consistently as we'd like, 
probably under budgeted more than it should be relative to other sectors of the organization. And then the most critical point is, you know, we oftentimes look at these major overhauls of uh, women platform experiences for our clients on a, let's say every three to five year cycle tied to some big RFP where it's kind of like your one shot to try and really approach how to improve the experience. And then uh, the way I like to call it, it's sort of like the, you know, hot water uh, heater or, or, you know, repair the roof. It's like you do it once and then you just, the organization overall is not thinking about the continual investment and maintenance of it. It's kind of a one-time thing that you do every three to five years. And then it just really doesn't have the kind of central approach to iteration and optimization over time that ideally it really should. So the, what that leads to is what I call is the bento box effect where you have a really complex organization and everyone on that website gets their own little square. It's sort of a consensus building exercise of how do you, how does everyone cram in that one thing they need every three to five years? And so I think we all know a lot of websites that, that look like that, a million little boxes and every, every team has their own little portion of it. Uh, and that's just a natural reflection of sort of the complexity of consensus management and stakeholder management in big projects like this. So, you know, in essence, what these cycles of, of redesigns look like is sort of like this. Um, every three year cycle or so, big website design project, website implemented, then a cycle of neglect. And then we gear up again and do the whole thing over again. And then we slide back down into that kind of cycle of neglect. And it just, you know, we keep doing this. And needless to say to all the people in the room that's preaching to the choir, we all know that this is a, a just, you know, crazy way to think about this central piece of the experience for, for our clients overall. So Blue State's mindset is really, you know, how can we go from, from this, which is frankly the reality for more so, most organizations, to this, which is not getting away from still doing major overhauls and redesigns every, you know, every so often, but how do you kind of build in more of a continuous cycle of iteration and optimization in the chapters of time in between? That is a major mindset shift. It's a, it's a major organizational shift, process shift, and then also a budgeting shift too. Um, I think that's a big, big part of why we are where we are with these things only being approached every so often is, is oftentimes a financial reality of that too. So we'll touch on, on all of those things about how we've worked with clients like MSF to try and shift that mindset and frankly approach the website in the same way that we would email programs, social, paid media, where endless amounts of resources and time often are allocated to those areas. And like we'd never dream of launching an email program and not interrogating and optimizing and testing that continuously. And the question really is, why wouldn't we be building a culture of understanding of our websites oftentimes um, you know, our, our websites often being as central to the outcomes for our organizations as any of those other channels are. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Taylor again to talk specifically about how we did that in partnership with MSF USA. Thanks. So yeah, a lot of what I'll try and do is use our project as just a way of kind of building this example or drawing these connections. Like how do you kind of socialize a user first sort of mentality across stakeholders. What's the reason that you're doing that? Um, there are so many things I could talk about. Uh, there's only so much time, but I really wanna leave space for a Q and A. This can be an open thing. I wanna hear about your experiences too. Uh, any questions, you can share any challenges that you've had about how you manage uh, stakeholders, how you need to try and build consensus in your organization. We can commiserate a little bit if we have to, um, but okay, I'll dive right in. First. What are we talking about? Who is MSF USA? Well, MSF, uh, International Movement, uh, we often say movement, so I'll be using that for the organization shorthand, um, has 25 associations. Uh, MSF USA is one. And while I think there, uh, before my time, I've been in my role for almost two years, there was some consideration or inquiry into whether we'd want to unify all the web properties for these associations, use a shared framework, um, as it stands, these are separate entities on the website in their own governance, on their own stacks, et cetera. So we are talking about doctorswithoutborders.org, uh, which is the web presence for MSF USA specifically. You know, while all the funds we raise can go anywhere internationally, um, we are communicating primarily to a US audience. We are fundraising primarily from a US audience. We are recruiting primarily 
uh, from a US audience on doctorswithoutborders.org. So I don't have the whole tale of the tape, but I think our, the web presence for the organization is mostly mirroring how the fundraising is working as it currently stands, but who knows where we'll go in the future, especially in learning all that we did about uh, the things upcoming in Drupal. Uh, so what's the website for, doctorswithoutborders.org? It's for a bunch of things. And the governance of it uh, is similarly, you know, spread across many different teams. On the one hand, there are lots of communications needs and goals. You know, it's spreading awareness about what's happening in the movement, what's happening in operations, what we're doing. Uh, bearing witness, you know, saying what we see in the field impartially, uh, holding entities accountable. This is a part of our charter, something we need to do. And so in that way, you know, the publishing that we're doing on the website is actually a critical, fu critical function of what the organization exists to do. Uh, similarly, you know, all going hand in hand, reporting on the operations uh, to our U.S. audience. And also I wanted to include this, you know, holding the movement accountable as well. Uh, it's a space where we want to ongoingly uh, publish you know, things about self-inquiry, um, being critical of ourselves, uh, making sure that that conversation is out there too is something that we want to have the space for on our website. So these are communications kind of pillars or goals. Development, not software development, but of course fundraising, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar, uh, is another critical need for the website. Um, it's raising funds for the medical humanitarian aid uh, that is being delivered around the world. Um, it is providing resources to the donors, you know, that specifically the development audience, uh, potential and existing donors uh, may need documentation, instruction, support, um, and then also cultivation for some of those kind of one-to-one -one relationships we have with major givers, um, those sorts of things. The website is often used as a step in that process for kind of one-to-one -one communication. Field HR is another critical need. Um, while over 80% of MSF staff are actually hired locally in the countries where they work, this is kind of a misconception that we want to do away with. Uh, you know that everyone that works for MSF is a volunteer who's flown from a Western country elsewhere. That is not the case, although it is kind of a prevailing uh, misconception. But I want to note that here. Um, there is still, though, a need for us to recruit uh, international staff uh, to fill any gaps that we might have in the operations where we're working. So it is still a critical need for the site, of course, um, to be getting recruits, who are paid staff, by the way. And there's a whole lot of other needs. Uh, domestic HR, meaning uh, recruiting and hiring for the New York office specifically. Uh, we have events teams, uh, student chapters, and the people who manage those relationships. Advocacy, um, programs and operations, uh, a medical team that actually publishes research. Um, and as an internal resource, this is something I was actually a little surprised by when I started in the role. You know, the website is constantly used as like the record of truth internally as well for people to understand the history of what we've done in areas, uh, to understand our stances on sometimes, you know, complicated subjects. Um, so this is all to say that the, there's a lot of things the website has to do and governance then is spread apart in many different ways. Um, certain teams own certain pages. And the one thing I wanted to note too is that there is a very cherished culture of debate in the organization. We don't want to mince any words when we're debating things, when we're trying to figure out what the right approach is. Um, but obviously when you're working on a website or an application, sometimes debate is a little scary. Uh, it can be a hard thing to manage and I bet you all have some experience uh, in that. So when we started, you know, we thought that we would focus on experiments, you know, in kind of smaller areas of the website uh, to raise conversions, that being the goal from the start. But we really thought that after, you know, talking to all of our stakeholders and honestly just going with our gut and seeing what the website was, that none of these pillars were kind of being delivered on. We weren't meeting their goals. Um, by trying to do so many things, nothing was quite sufficient across all those different pillars or teams. So instead, uh, we pivoted to build a better uh, UX and UI foundation uh, to make a better communications experience, to make a better development experience, feel HR, ultimately to make a better visitor experience. And this is the thing we really wanted to socialize and have people understand at every level of the organization is that this was what we wanted to accomplish by embarking on this project. And that segues into how you can undertake change management. Um, 
we wanted to align on objectives and KPIs ongoingly to be sure that everyone understood why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we want to ensure that the highest level stakeholders are aligned on goals. And of course, you want to go through that debate uh, up front uh, because you'd much rather surface and resolve misalignments early than see the symptoms of that later on uh, when it actually turns into scope, gre uh, scope creep, um, more expenses, hard pivots. So while it may sound like very general, you know, to say we want to make the website a better visitor experience, you need to have goals that match your stakeholders' place in your organization, match the level that they operate on. Because something as general as that can have real meaning to someone who's not so close to the project. Um, and their KPIs, you know, accordingly will be some of the highest level ones, you know, overall revenue, uh, paid views, things like that. But this needs to ladder down through the organization. When you get to the specific teams that have governance over specific pages, they're going to have narrower, more specific goals and KPIs too. And you want those all socialized, and you want them to kind of ladder up into each other or be, you know, like Russian dolls where if you have any sort of debate or disagreement at one of the lower levels, you know you can lean on the people one layer up to help resolve and arbitrate, you know? But having that, the goals confirmed um, goes very far, obviously. Kind of what I was saying, uh, once you're aligned on goals, you need to understand not just who like the ultimate decision makers are, if you do need to escalate, you know, up through the organization, but you wanna identify more specific supporting roles. Uh, you know, who's informed, who's consulted. Uh, many stakeholders can be involved as subject matter experts, you know, participants in surveys, uh, reviewers of design and everything, if those lines of arbitration are clear. Um, but hopefully through some of the things, you know, I'll share. And this next note, like you don't need too often to resort to that sort of escalation. Because this third point is maybe the most important one to me at least, or where I saw kind of the most payoff in how we managed this project is that we wanted to really socialize this notion of being user-centric or putting users and visitors first. So I said, socialize user-first consensus building. Like, make it known that this is kind of your decider. The ultimate guide and swing vote, you know, is what your audience wants. And that you can really manage stakeholders and keep them along for the ride and make them have buy-in in your project if you're engaging them by educating them about the decisions that you're making, educating them about the techniques you're using, the conventions in the industry or space and what you're doing, that's a way of keeping your stakeholders involved. And frankly, it's a way of priming them to the work that you're going to do and the solutions that you're going to deliver. Um, I think that if we had reached and finished the project exactly as it is now, having done it, without involving stakeholders. If people saw it today, they wouldn't be happy with it because they weren't involved. They might see it and say like, where did this come from? But they were involved, we socialized the practice and everything that we we're doing and I think that's why um, people are so happy with it now. So one note though is that we wanted to build the project or structure everything around this notion, uh, this goal of having the space and room to take stakeholders along for the ride. And so the way that we structured the contract was through an annual retainer for website evolution uh, with a bucket of hours and no fixed deliverables up front. Um, there are some other things too that we did, uh, such as kind of decoupling um, design sprints from development sprints. We wanted there to be a healthy amount of space between when we design a component and when we actually developed it. Because by having discovery with so many different stakeholders through the whole project, we knew we'd want to revisit a component's design. We would surface and discover more use cases than one team's. And so by spacing things out when we were developing them, we didn't have to make hard pivots. Um, we were able just to expand or create more flexibility in the designs before we made too hard of a commitment. And I should say too, uh, maybe this is better for the end, but. You know, a lot of this too, I think is something that you can do as an internal stakeholder. It didn't require me working directly with the Blue State team to do a lot of this work internally and taking them along for the ride. So I see it as just wanting to have the space in your role and the empowerment, um, the time to do all this people work, frankly, um, that can help you have success in your project. All right, so. I'll fly through these, some quick examples. I think we're doing okay on time actually, but some examples of specific things we changed on the website and how this kind of ties back into the socialization, the stakeholder work that we were doing. 
So first, the navigation and information architecture. The, the D bento boxing, as delicious as those look. So this is the old site. This is the old homepage um, and a snapshot of the navigation. Um, it's a lot of menu items. Um, and we kind of knew from the get-go that this put a big burden on the visitors to the website, that if they were looking for some specific content, they had to parse through a huge number of items to try and find it. Um, it's a similar thing um, underneath all of these different uh, main labels. Uh, sometimes there are even you know, sub-sub menus appearing afterwards. And it reflects that you know, dispersed kind of governance of the website. You know? There are so many different teams that knew they had to have their content on the website and instead of thinking where does it fit, it's just make a page, add it to a menu. Uh, but it doesn't lead to a very navigable or intuitive experience uh, for the users on the website. Um, some things too semantically, you know, are just kind of tricky. You see there's links for support us, take action, and donate. But what is the difference between supporting us and taking an action is donating not both? Um, you get the picture. So what we landed on, if we look at a snapshot of kind of our new homepage and navigation, uh, was something that has way fewer items. Um, we wanted to introduce uh, things like labels, you know, contextual clues to increase the information sent, you know, give people clues about the content they'll find in these subsections, uh, to make it, you know, just a simpler thing to glean. You know, people don't have to try going into so many different pages uh, to find what they're looking for. Um, the thing I really want to call out, though, from kind of like the stakeholder management perspective is that we cut a lot of content or we consolidated it, we moved it into other pages. Like, there is no longer that designated space for press room, for a video page, um, for the research. They were reorganized. Some of it was cut, but a lot of it was moved into different areas so that we have just clearer lanes for users to navigate through, like clearer user journeys where we're actually building a path in sequence uh, to the content that we're organizing. And we were only able to do that by getting that buy-in on the goals that we had for the site, on that you know, visitor-centric kind of vision. That was the thing that made people okay with hard choices of cutting or parsing down content or moving it or intertangling it with another team's content. It was all for the sake of making that clear user journey for visitors. A specific example, too, and how we wanted to socialize UX best practices to um, reach a better end. You know, in that example of the previous main navigation, there was a very prominent careers link in the main navigation. And the field HR team and domestic HR teams, when they saw that we had removed that from the main navigation, were understandably concerned that this would lead to fewer visits onto their pages, you know, fewer views. But, you know, it is a convention. We were able to show this to our stakeholders that across pretty much every industry now uh, on, the, on the World Wide Web, you'll find you know, links to uh, recruitment or jobs uh, in the footer and sometimes in this top right kind of, um, or top left, like eyebrow position. And it was after they understood the conventions and best practices that they were okay uh, with us doing this. But we had plenty of time you know, to take people along for the ride and really teach people uh, the reasons behind the choices we were making. And just a quick note, you know, we actually did user testing to validate um, the new approach. We asked users, you know, where would you find this piece of content, compared it between the old navigation and the new, and got really tangible data that showed the improvements that we could expect. And we did make alterations to our proposal, you know, based on that. Okay, another thing, critical homepage content. I'll fly through this. The old homepage um, had a lot of news and stories content, uh, which is critical, um, something that we want to include and have kept. Um, but you can imagine, you know, stakeholders within a development department uh, will see that this is lacking something that has like a clear appeal or a fundraising ask. Um, and the changes that we made, I think, produced a lot of win-wins. Um, and obviously that's a great thing to go after when you're managing a project like this, is surfacing what can be shared wins across different teams. Um, when we're thinking about what are the gaps here though, what was lacking on that homepage? Well, we actually had evidence that showed, this is the internal um, site search feature, that people could not find a mission statement. You know, for someone that's 
unfamiliar with what our organization does, this is of course critical and something we want to introduce. Um, it's something that is a shared win across all departments if we can actually get people understanding of the work that we do. Um, this is also reflected, of course, in you know, the data we have and Google searches and everything. So if you scroll below the large image at the top of our new homepage, this is the new component uh, that we introduced, something that actually has a clear statement about what we do, uh, links people into um, upper funnel content, what we do. So already kind of building in more paths for users that are clear. And it introduces impact statistics and statistics around how we use funds um, that really is a shared win across both departments. You know, impact statistics being something that is uh, the communications department really cares about, but how we use funds, we know potential donors uh, need to see that information um, when they're considering whether or not to support us. So leaner content and new calls to action. Uh, this was a big one. If we look at an example of a old country page, um, here's the country page for Syria. After the large image up top, you get into a lot of content. So if you scroll down a little further, you'd see something like this. And you could actually scroll through multiple, you know, viewports or full pages worth of scroll and just continue to see something like this. It's a lot of text because we have a lot we need to share um, and be very specific about like what's happening in these different environments. If you reach the very bottom of the page after, again, multiple viewports worth of scroll there, here's something that would stand out to a development stakeholder as being lacking. You know, this call to action is just links, hyperlinks added to the bottom of the page um, that obviously is not going to stand out uh, very strongly to someone visiting the page and engaging with the content. And sure enough, this helped us get buy-in from our communication stakeholders to make these changes. Uh, if we looked at like scroll mapping, we, are, we could see that the vast majority of users on the site never actually reached uh, those CTAs. And one thing I should tie back to when it comes to the shared goals um, and how you need that to help arbitrate the work once you get into the specifics, up front, we had asked all of our stakeholders to confirm for us what are the main things this website has to do. And the communications department, uh, field HR department, let alone um, development, all agreed that raising funds is the most critical thing this website must exist to do. Um, we need those funds, obviously, to do what we do out in the field and provide the life-saving care uh, that must be delivered. So because we aligned on those goals up front, it made it much easier to hearken back to that, get people to agree and confirm uh, have buy-in in the changes that we'd make uh, to this page. So a quick look at that. Um, this is what you'd see kind of the top of the page. You know, just wanting to make things kind of more graphical and stand out, um, introducing styles that are different from other content types on the website that used to all have kind of the same pattern. But then again, it's kind of like a shared win is we found ways to address the needs of multiple personas coming to the website. So the development persona is often someone who's visiting the website who came from an email or who might have came from a social network. Um, they may be in a mindset that is more operating on a quick kind of scan level. Um, they want to see the summary information um, and get through the page. Uh, they may already feel compelled to donate after getting kind of a high level synopsis. But for that communications persona, we also need to address um, the needs of a visitor who wants the entire story, uh, who does want to understand all the nuances of what we're doing. So a component like this is a win for both teams uh, because it can shorten that scroll, make things more scannable, but we don't actually have to parse down the story and the needs of those stakeholders in the communications department. Um, I'll say too that all these components have many use cases across the whole website. You know, This is not something that we designed to operate and work only on our country pages, including that kind of image modal below that has these statistics next to it. These all have use cases across both departments and many areas of the website. So because we had stretched out discovery, uh, we were able to deliver or design you know, UX uh, and visual designed components that satisfied many, many use cases. It just made it an efficient use of our time and unlocked lots of content work later on. At the bottom of the page, uh, we introduced a new uh, call to action kind of system. Um, and the thing I'd call out here is that this is one of the hard things for communications um, 
to accept sometimes. The thing that we're always hesitant to do is to place CTAs that could infer restricted giving, meaning we don't want someone on the Syria page who makes a donation to think that their funds are going directly to Syria. That would be, uh, you know, we don't want to accidentally um, make the wrong impression when these are unrestricted funds that we can use anywhere in the movement. So it was through educating our stakeholders and kind of the techniques we can use in visual design where we got buy-in and people to accept this kind of new design where we use the visual elements to really separate it from the body of the text um, on our different article pages, on country pages. And that got people really accepting and on board with what I think is a much more kind of dynamic um, call to action that can really uh, stand out to users and make a good impression. And one thing I'll note is that the vast majority of content was actually left alone. Uh, this was something that we uh, decided to do pretty early up front as a way of streamlining a lot of the work that we were doing. You know, we really wanted to focus on the information uh, architecture, um, giving ourselves a strong new foundation, organizing the content we had, knowing that so many people can get hung up on the messaging, on the words on a page. Um, we really wanted to focus on kind of the system that we are building, and that has unlocked lots more optimization for us to do on the content side. So what's next? Uh, like I said, you know, components were designed to be flexible, so now we can have a parallel work stream that works in content uh, with the new components that we've built, unlocking a ton of new things that we can do. Um, and that, now that we have what I'd call you know, a tightened information architecture, you know, it gives us kind of constraints to work in. People are thinking about uh, how can they collaborate to improve on the areas or the subsections we have instead of thinking, I need content, so I'm gonna make a new page and I'm gonna add it to a menu. And I'm, I'd be remiss if I didn't know that you know, content work doesn't require development time usually, and that can be a great way of getting wins with stakeholders. Uh, now that we have this kind of new baseline, um, we want to measure the effects of what we've changed. Um, we want to understand what kind of the new performance levels are across the website and react accordingly you know, with uh, new hypotheses, uh, new tests to run, and ultimately changes to make. But that's all simpler now that we have better defined uh, user journeys on the site. And again, uh, the ongoing you know, socialization of techniques, best practices, and this user first ethos. You know, everything can be more efficient if you have that buy-in and knowledge across many teams. Um, so that you're cultivating you know, holistic approaches and collaboration uh, to avoid siloing and bento boxing. Instead of someone thinking, uh, my content needs to go on the site, so I'll add a page. They can see what these new lanes are, what the new information architecture is, and really keep top of mind like these personas we have on the site and figure out where is their content most relevant? Um, where does it make the most sense and who should they collaborate with? What other owners uh, to make it happen? And with that, I'll hand it back to Katie. So, we want to just do a wrap up of a few of the things that we feel are like principles, key takeaways, things to always be coming back to and reminding ourselves when we approach this category of work. Again, not even just about the specific solutions that MSF was able to arrive at and through this process, but things that I think are just universals for how to approach in the mindset of um, these kinds of uh, projects. So one is really think about designing your project with consensus building um, from the very beginning. I, and really thinking about what's the core group that you wanna have pulled in from the, like there's, there's no, almost no way in which you can do that too early in the process. Um, websites, website redesigns or product, I mean, these somehow become the most political fraught projects of all the projects that I work on with clients, which span well beyond website work. And it really is because it's this one time where people have a shot to have their portion of their initiative featured. And we know how those politics can play out very, very quickly on the limited kind of one shot of presenting your organization to the world through the, through the website. So that's one thing I think is just even if you make a different decision, if you've really thought about how to bring in the right stakeholders from the very beginning, you're gonna save yourself so much pain uh, in the long run of having to kind of retroactively find a way to address those, those concerns of people feeling as though their organization wasn't heard or left out in the process. Second, um, really don't skimp on educating people about why a certain decision is the right one. And I think showing don't, like show don't tell is a very, very important thing here. Um, 
what Taylor talked about, like just even being able to kind of show, well, look at these other organizations or these other brands and sort of the way in which these conventions are evolving to kind of assuage those concerns or feelings that people would have um, is always gonna go so much better than just saying, this is why we need to do this. And I think that's just intuitive, but yet we, in the rush and limited time and capacity that we have around these projects, just oftentimes don't create a lot of space for that. And then just further those rifts and divisions that sometimes can form internally around projects like this. Um, building the ca build the case for ongoing investment with performance data. So one thing we didn't really talk about, but I think is generally true, is you know we're really close to the numbers. For example, on a fundraising um, side for many of our clients, about how many dollars are raised from email versus paid versus website. And while it's not always universally true, usually the website is bringing in substantially more than any one of those other channels. But yet again, the resource investment for that doesn't always reflect what it should, should be, where there should be the same kind of resources and investment um, approached with the website. So know your data, know your performance, own it, socialize it. At the end of the day, senior stakeholders listen to this more than anything. And I think that that's something that we oftentimes forget to champion, particularly around like the website channel, um, regardless of what your organization's goals are. Really be unafraid to show that data and then hold yourself accountable to that data ongoing as a way to build, um, build uh, support for further investment. And then I think this is a really important thing. If you are able to shift the organization from the mindset of that you have one shot, one redesign to get it right, that's a really great way to start to remind people that it's not as though you have just one shot to get it right either. Uh, and so that can really diffuse the, the tension or the, um, you know, the conflict that can arise around, around these projects. And, and I'm kind of making it seem as though these are, are you know, terrible projects. That's not it. It's just we know that, that these things can arise, and we've probably all seen it. And so I think that, I think that just reminding people that you know, the launch of the site is just the start and that that is not a, a set in stone thing. So I come back to that point time and time again when we're debating trying to arrive at the perfect decision. It's like, this is not about that and we have to shift our mindset. If you think of a big brand like uh, Nike up the road, they would never think this is our one shot to get this one feature right on the homepage once every three years. That's just not the way the rest, rest of the world thinks and we have to do a better job of socializing that in our own organizations. So with that, We've wrapped up our portion. We've got about, I think about 10 minutes for any questions that folks have. So happy to field, field anything from the crowd if there are any questions. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So the the question uh, to repeat it, yeah, was around user testing and whether or not we were um, running user tests kind of before, during, and after kind of when uh, we were doing these tests to kind of give us data to act on. Is that right? Um, yeah, there was a wealth of data uh, we had for the project, but often um, kind of unfiltered that we wanted to surface um, insights from, glean from, you know, things like what's available in Google Analytics, doing kind of a page performance analysis to see how users were navigating through the website. And that really surfaced like up front, this clear picture that people were entering the website from a million different places and they were quitting from every one of them. Um, there weren't kind of clear funnels uh, for people to move through engaging with content. So a lot of the upfront work to kind of create a problem statement was done with data more so than direct user testing. Um, but once we got into designing components, um, it was especially that navigation that we showed, um, that also being the IA, like the real kind of organizing structure for the site, where we wanted to validate a new approach first. Um, those are the two main areas where we started with, um, along with just making sure that we're doing all sorts of you know, accessibility testing for the new designs that we had, um, that we all wanted to be very confident in um, while getting to the launch of like these changes. Now that they are live, what we want to do is 
assess more clearly, like how people are moving through the site, uh, wanting to get into more um, anecdotal research, both with our internal stakeholders and visitors, uh, to surface the new hypotheses. Um, so given that we haven't changed too much content just yet, um, we felt confident that we were just doing or covering the bases for kind of a new organization on the site. Now that we're going to get more into messaging and further optimization, we really want to get uh, into some anecdotal research. Yeah. Hi. I'm curious about the research. Do you mean like real time on site or like a more pop up or are you guys doing more focused research? Yeah, the question is how are we doing uh, research? Is it th real time uh, on the site um, through a modal or a pop up? Is it anecdotal? Um, different areas of the site, uh, we've run different kinds of tests. So, for example, the ways to give section of the website is obviously something kind of in the development department's governance. We've run lots of surveys there um, through existing you know, third-party tools uh, to create pop-ups and ask people whether they're finding what they need, uh, what their experience is, um, and inviting them for focus group sessions. Um, we're often using other channels too, um, like our email channel to invite kind of super supporters to be involved in focus grouping uh, so we can continue doing work there. So it's a mix of both. Um, there's lots of insight we can get obviously from analytics and parsing through everything there. In areas where the persona is so specific or clear, that's where we're really excited to get people into focus groups. You know, um, The people who are navigating those ways to give pages, for instance, are a very specific kind of subset of donors. It's distinct from you know the first level donors we have. Um, so yeah, we're trying to kind of scale up or scale down, uh, get more or less bespoke in how we're doing research depending on the persona we're targeting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll actually add one. Can you guys hear this? Okay. Yeah. All right. One other thing I'll say, not with MSF, but um, with a couple other organizations that I've worked with over the years. Um, the other thing that we've done is try to set. What I would describe is, I mean, we actually use this phrase, and I think it's helpful. It's called a learning agenda, right? So what, what are the things that we might have hypotheses about post-launch that we want to run longer-term tests and experiments on, leveraging tools like Optimizely to run specific tests, and even doing using that, you know, tools like that to make, you know, minor front-end changes that don't require a lot of reworking of the underlying architecture of the site. So a great example of this is many years ago, we worked with the Nature Conservancy. There were you know, a handful of things that we were curious about changing on their homepage, but didn't want to make anything that was potentially going to negatively impact fundraising performance. So not going in and making larger changes. They didn't have the resources to do a big redesign. So we ran a number of like concentrated tests around some high traffic areas of the site that we knew could really drive performance. Ran those tests through Optimizely. It wasn't even necessarily a formal user research uh, experiment, but was able to really give us the data that we needed to know if we were safe to go in ahead and implement some of those changes in between larger redesign cycles. And that, I don't know the top of my head, but you know, resulted in some you know, pretty substantial increase in year-over-year -year revenue for their end-of-year fundraising, for example. So that's another great tool that you can use when you're not necessarily um, positioned to have access to regular ongoing user testing. One thing I'll add um, is that it was a real benefit of having ongoing discovery through the whole project as well. Um, that helped us to surface insights from lots of different team members at different times. You know, in, in my experience past, you know, when I was agency side, you know, many products would have very concentrated upfront discovery with a limited set of stakeholders. Um, but in working on this project, we may have been months in um, and we talked to a specific team member who's aware of a specific set of market research that we surface and ends up like generating or highlighting like some very powerful use cases that we wanted to target against or uh, helps motivate our content strategy in a certain area because we realized that we did have this documentation on hand that said, you know, they engage with this kind of content best and that sort of thing. I think having the space for that discovery over time and all that stakeholder involvement really made sure that we weren't missing things um, for us to kind of build into, yeah, the, the UX that we're delivering. I think we have time for like one or two more. I got five or so minutes left. If there's any other questions. Structure or similar structure 
Oh, so I have also experience with uh, NGOs and you know that some of programs are in a different way and people when have when you need to be in the same structure it's uh, difficult for them like to yeah. Get to yeah, so the question is kind of around, you know, when you're having an organization that has its own website um, or property in general, brand expression but there are many different sister organizations doing the same thing. Um, what arises from differences? You know, is there a tension or is there a need to kind of spread and share what's changed? Um, how is it navigated? That's kind of the general question. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll say first that we absolutely want to socialize and share like a lot of the work that we've done because we could see it being creating strong improvements in different other areas on some of the sister sites. And I think that the ways that we could socialize that and get that adopted is through a lot of the ways that we've um, got buy-in from our internal stakeholders. If we are re really able to say through evidence and data that we are seeing better performance or a better user experience through the design changes we've made, um, then absolutely I think there's a much greater chance that it will be kind of accepted and adopted and that will make a more consistent you know, brand across the board and that is all sorts of benefits in terms of just visibility, association with our brand. Um, for instance, you know, one of the things that we changed is that all of the headers we used to have on our site used to be uh, white text on a very red rectangle. And what do you know, that looked exactly like our buttons. <laughs> and so it's very easy to like make the case for other organizations or other websites, you know, to maybe uh, create some distinction there avoid rage clicking and a confusing user experience. So some things will be easier to socialize than others, but I definitely see there being benefits and want uh, to help make consistency across the board. Did, was, was there any like more specifics um, you had in mind or wanted to explore? Sure. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all.